The question we ask ourselves when we were concluding the last episode, we said, will Cain fall at God's feet? Will he repent? Will he cry out for mercy? Will he cry out and ask God to help him to believe? Will Cain move away from a life of rebellion and start to live by faith just like his brother? Or will will Cain doggedly continue down this path of destruction? So let us read Genesis chapter 4 and we are going to read verses 6 to 8. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin light at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. We've looked at all that, verse 8 now. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Wow. I mean, that is quite shocking i mean within a generation we've gone from the garden of eden into a murderer cain did not accept god's divine counsel cain totally rejected god's warning totally rejected god's counsel and that is what verse 8 is telling us cain leered his brother suggested to his brother and said let us go out into the field now we don't know how long after this conversation with God that Cain decided to do this? Okay, we know that there was a sacrifice, there was the rejection of Cain and his um, offering. We know that God came and have this intimate conversation with him. Now, from that point to the point where Cain then carry out this very gruesome act, an evil act, and kill his brother, we don't know. We don't know what was the period between each of them. What is clear is that during those period, no matter how long this period was during those period cain did not deal with this rebellious spirit this self-centeredness this wounded pride that cain was carrying around his jealousy and his anger he obviously did not <laughs> seek god for help he obviously did not seek god's mercy that much we know his conscience was seared his conscience was cauterized as if with a red hot branding iron of sin of evil of rebellion and this left him incapable of any form of ethical reasoning and functioning cain by this moment by this time has lost all righteous feeling he could not separate again what is right from what is wrong where did it all start from all this started from rebellion all this started from malice in the heart of Cain. That is where it started from. But it didn't end, end there. It ended in a mother. A mother of his own brother. He was supposed to be his brother's keeper. He was the senior brother. He was supposed to be looking after his brother. He was supposed to be protecting his brother. But unfortunately, he ended up killing him. He lied. He deceived his brother. He lured him into a lonely place, away from the city, away from his parents, away from people that could have helped him. He attacked him suddenly. And the way we read it, it is clear that Abel did not see the attack coming. He likely did not offer any form of resistance because he didn't know that his brother that he trusted was going to kill him. Cain murdered Abel. Cain has been taken Cain has been overpowered by evil and by the evil one. He has become a slave to sin. He has become a slave to the devil. He has become a slave to darkness and evil. Like we read, remember in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says we must not be like Cain who belonged to the, to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was wrong and his brother has been doing what was righteous so the bible definitely tells us here that cain who belongs to the evil one he has been taken over he has become evil personified in himself just like the devil in the beginning and the question is just like what we what we read there why did cain kill abel what was abel's fault Okay, in all these issues that was happening, what was his fault? Why did he have to kill his brother? Cain had himself to blame. He was responsible for his own rejection. <laughs> he had his, himself to blame. It was not. It was not Abel's fault that Cain was rejected. 
Cain could have made things right. He could have repented. And he could have asked God for forgiveness. He could have obeyed God. He has himself to blame, but no. He refused to take responsibility for his action. Rather, he blamed his brother for his rejection. He did not see himself as the problem, but he saw his brother Abel as, as the problem. And as such, if Abel was the problem, if Abel was the cause of his rejection, then Abel must be punished. Remember when we were doing those teaching on anger a few, few episodes ago? And that was exactly, that was the perverse reason, twisted reason why he justified killing his own brother in his own mind. Instead of being jealous of his brother Abel, Cain could have learned from the success of his brother. Hebrews 10 verses 23 and 24 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Verse 24 is where I'm going. He said, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works. The word provoke here does not mean to offend. It does not mean to irritate. It does, it does not mean to incense somebody. But rather, that word in the Greek is quite interesting. It means to arouse, to excite, to call into action. It's an excitement. It's an impulse. In other words, the Bible is telling us here that we are to endeavor, we as Christians, and obviously we are applying that to Cain and Abel, we are to endeavor to arouse and excite each other to the manifestation of love. In other words, we should arouse and excite each other to go do good, not to do evil. But unfortunately, Cain did not allow Abel's success to excite him, to arouse him, to challenge him to do what is good. Unfortunately, he rather chose to be offended by his brother's testimony. And doesn't that happen in the church today? Something good, something great has happened to somebody. Rather than rejoicing with them and learning from their success and say, what can I learn from this brother? Rejoice with her. Rejoice with the brother, with the sister. Rejoice that God has done them so well. And also learn from them. They may be your junior. They may be your senior. Something good has happened to them. And you need that. Why don't you move close to them? Rejoice with them in their testimony and ask questions. Okay? Not because you are jealous of them, but because they challenge you to know that the God that has done it for them will also do it for you. But Cain did not allow Abel's success to excite him and arouse him. To doing what is good now there are some specific lessons we can learn from this incident we we've gone through them i just want to highlight them okay specific lesson from this incident number one the basis of sin is rebellion against the kingship and against the lordship of god and this is really important Sin is actually turning away from God. It is rejecting God. It is rebelling against God. We don't want him to be king over us. We don't want him to be lord over us. We will do our own thing. We will make our own rule. We will go our own way. We will think our own thought. We will do our own thing. We will do it our own way. At the basic fundamental level, that is the source of sin. That is the basis of sin. And that is what we see here in Cain. Second lesson, sin, if not overcome, give back to another sin. Sin doesn't come alone. Sin comes in group. First it was anger, then it was deceit, then it was murder. There's no small sin because any sin that we don't deal with, if I lie and I don't deal with that, I will have to tell greater lie, more lie, and then I will have to do things to cover my lie and on and on. Number three, sin in the earth, sin in our heart will manifest in the hands, in the mouth, and in the feet. We will speak it out sooner or later. In one form or another, whether anger or abuse or whatever, or lies, it will be in the hand. It will be turned into action. And the last lesson I want to highlight here is that Satan often lures humans away from potential help, then trap them and ultimately kill them. The Bible says that the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Oftentimes in the modus operandi or the modus operandi of the devil or in the way the devil works, is oftentimes it tends to isolate people from other people that can help them. Either isolate them physically or isolate them mentally, you know. 
nobody can tell me what to do. I know it all. They can be there physically, but mentally they have been separated because they feel that nobody can tell them or they know it all. Or it can be physical separation. And that is some of the lessons that we learned from this incident. I mean, just think about this. Think about this. That one action on the part of Cain could have resolved this problem, could have averted this catastrophe. One action from Cain could have stopped this downward trend towards murder. And what is that action? Repentance. If only Cain had repented, that could have stopped this evil from manifesting to this catastrophic level of him killing his brother. And you understand that in some previous teaching, we have looked at this concept of repentance. If only Cain had repented. Repentance is God's precious gift of love to human. And I'm going to spend the rest of this teaching, this episode today, to talk about repentance. And also when we come back in the next episode by the grace of God. Repentance. If only Cain repented, he would not have killed his brother. It will have been accepted by God. Repentance is God's precious gift of love to human. Repentance is one of God's greatest gift to us. And you know, when you think about it, the fact that God allowed us to repent and also provided us with the means and the ways to repent is mind-blowing. The fact that God allow us to repent and give us the means the ways and the method to repent is a great grace it's a great mercy it's a great privilege that god has given us and this is mind-blowing it must have costed god something to give us this advantage so what did it cost god we said that the basis of sin is rebellion against god now if the basis of sin is rebellion against God himself, his kingship and his lordship, then the basis of repentance is turning back to God. You see this? Repentance undo that which sin has done. Repentance undo. The Bible says that for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest to do what? To destroy, to undo, to destroy the works of the devil. Repentance takes power away from the devil. Repentance takes control away from the devil. The basis of sin is turning away from God. Therefore, the basis of repentance is turning back to God. And that is very, very important. It's turning back to God. And obviously, in turning back to God, we turn away from sin. We turn away from evil. We turn turn away from wickedness. But understand that the basis of repentance Repentance is that we are turning back to God. And that is very, very important. And when we look at the scripture, two Hebrew words help us to understand repentance. Now, I'm only going to focus on one here. And it is the word shuv. And that is S-H-U-V. And the Hebrew word teshuva, which is, which is the common Hebrew word that is used for repentance. Now, you can see the the word shove right in the middle. So, teshuva is common Hebrew word for repentance. And you can see that word shove there. So, in teshuva, the root word that gives teshuva its meaning is that word shove, S-H-U-V. That gives teshuva its meaning. It's almost like the engine, the engine in the car, isn't it? And shove... What does it mean? In its various form, it appears in various form over 1,000 times in the Old Testament in various form. And when you want to search out the meaning of an Hebrew word in the Bible, one of the best way to do it is to find out when this word was first used in the scripture. So we are going to look at when this word shove was first used in the Bible, where it first appeared and what the meaning tells us. And through that, it will begin to tell us some of the foundational meaning of this word. So shove first appear in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. You know what happened in Genesis chapter 3? Obviously, that was the fall. Adam and Eve, they 
rebel. They've eaten the fruit God told them not to eat. God has turned up on the scene and God was meting out judgment. Now, I want, to, I want to go back just briefly, just so that we can have a good understanding of this word. Genesis chapter 3. Now, I'm going to verse 19, but I just want you to see verse 17 says, And unto Adam God said. So, God was speaking to Adam. Now, I've put some Hebrew word in front of two words, and I want you to see. And unto Adam God said, In the sweat of thy faith, of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now you will see the Bible talk about ground, dust, and dust. Now the Hebrew word for all those is the same, and is Adama. Adama. Now that is the word from which the name Adam came from. So Adam came out of the dust. So the word Adam actually came out from Adama. God created his body from the dust. So God called him Adam because he came from Adama. He came from the ground. He came from the dust. And then shove there, you can see shove. The Bible says, verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return. And the last one says that for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So this is actually helping us to see the meaning of repentance. Repentance implies moving from one thing or moving from one place to another. It's a movement. It's a movement. Dust, from dust you came. Okay, that place says that from dust you are, you came out of dust and you are returning back to dust. And that is what is at the heart of repentance. It's a movement of one thing. It's a movement from one thing or one place to another. It is to return. It is to repent. It is to turn back. It is to turn around. So to repent is to, to turn back to God. It is to return to the beginning of everything. It is to return to God, the beginning of everything. And this is very, very important. It is to turn from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. And one popular example of this is the story of the so-called prodigal son that we read in the book of Luke chapter 15. And you can read that story from verse 11 to verse 32. Obviously, I'm not going to read all that. But verse 17 tells us something about the prodigal son. He's left the father. And that is the foundation of sin. That is the basis of sin. He left the father. He rebelled against the father. He turned away from the father. But the Bible tells us in verse 17, obviously, he's wasted everything. He was suffering. Verse 17 says, and when he came to his senses, he said, Verse 18 said, he said, I will set out, I will go back. Repentance is to go back, to return to the beginning, to return to the source, to return to God, to return to life. He said, I will go back to my father. That's repentance. And then he said, I will see. And obviously he did. He went back and he was forgiven. He went back and he was forgiven. And we can see that repentance and forgiveness goes hands in gloves. Repentance and forgiveness goes, we, we normally say hand in hand, or rather it goes hand in glove. Repentance plus forgiveness equals salvation. If only Cain has repented, he will have received forgiveness and he will have experienced salvation. And I'm just going to run through some couple of scripture that bring that on the table for us. And this is and obviously, we are not talking about Cain. We are not talking about Abel now. We are talking about us. And this is the most important thing for us. So let's read quickly, quickly through some couple of scriptures. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 to 4. Take it to yourself if thy brother trespass against thee. Rebuke him. Now, the process of rebuke is that process that brings us to the necessity to repent. Rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turned again to thee and saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive me. You see that? Turn again. 
to repent. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God said, If my people shall call by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and what and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. First John chapter 1, verse 6, 9 says, If we confess our sin, is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That forgiveness is predicated on repentance. Unfortunately, today we are living in a cancel culture where there's very little room for true repentance and very little offer of forgiveness. Now, I'm going to stop here today because I want to pick it up from this point. Remember, we are talking about Cain. That is how we got here. If only Cain has, Cain has repented, God will have forgiven him. We said, and all the subsequent catastrophe and nightmares that follow will have been averted if only Cain has repented. Don't we also put ourselves through unnecessary catastrophe and nightmare because we refuse to repent? And we are going to look a little bit more into this application, especially in our culture today where there's very little room for true repentance very little offer of forgiveness in this hideous cancel culture that we have created around ourselves. And if you are listening to me tonight, or any time that you are listening to me, I want you to know that God loves you. If only you will repent. Now, you cannot be forgiven. You cannot receive forgiveness. I cannot receive forgiveness if I don't repent. Okay? Okay? But if I repent today, there's forgiveness. And then there will be salvation. So tonight, I'm, or anytime you are hearing this, I'm asking you, God loves you. He's offering you life. He's offering you a nice second chance. We've done so horrible things, but in his love and his grace, he has made a provision. He has made it possible for us to repent and therefore have a second chance with him. But it's left to you and I. And I'm praying tonight that as God convict your heart, I want you to yield to him. Don't be like Cain. I want you to yield to him. Come to him and say, God, forgive me. He will. He will save you. He will be your father. He will walk the rest of this earth with you. And when this is all over, you can spend eternity with him in the new heaven and new earth. Do it right now.